Nope. Recording is now in progress. So if you do find the recording interesting, be sure to share it with your colleagues. Um, for information about future webinars, be sure to join our mailing list and follow us on Twitter and LinkedIn. Before we begin, I'd like to take a moment to acknowledge that Edmonton, the Edmonton Region Hydrogen Hub is located on Treaty 6 territory, which is a traditional meeting grounds, gathering place, and traveling route of the Cree, the Soto, the Blackfoot, the Métis, Dene and Nakota Sioux. We do encourage everybody watching to reflect on uh, the territory treaties and people where you live and work. I also encourage everyone to use the chat function to introduce yourselves, where you're from, uh, where you work, get some conversation going in that chat. Who knows what kind of connections you'll make. But we do also have, uh, we'll also have a Q&A at the end. So please put questions that you want answered um, and discussed in the Q&A box. So we should have those two different boxes. Um, and I'll be, I'll be ushering people towards the Q&A box throughout the webinar. So now is my pleasure to introduce our guests, Sean Allen and Widger Falk. Uh, Sean is a UBC alumni with a Bachelor of Applied Science in Metals and Materials Engineering. He's worked for over the, the past 20 years in the hydrogen industry, specializing in testing of high pressure cylinders and components. Sean has assisted in the construction and development of two hydrogen specific testing laboratories, first at Powertech Labs, where he worked for 17 years, and a second lab, which was built and constructed for the CSA group, uh, Langley, which <clears throat> then uh, was purchased by Testnet. Sean has participated in the standard development process for numerous hydrogen component standards, such as HGV 3.1 and others. Recently, with increased participation of uh, newcomers to the hydrogen industry, Sean has been providing hydrogen-specific training to help guide new employees and new companies on how to use hydrogen safely. With him, we have Widger Falk, who is a graduate engineer for energy and vehicle technology. He gained his practical experience as an aircraft and industrial engineer. He worked for eight years in the aviation industry and then 23 years in the automotive industry. He, here he was also responsible for the regional dealer working groups and trained the service managers. In 2015, Widger introduced the Toyota Mirai to the market for Toyota Germany. In the following years, he also took over project, product management and quality assurance for the fuel cell vehicle. Since then, he has been working on the topics of hydrogen and hydrogen infrastructure for mobility. Widger has been involved in the Hydrogen Academy since 2023. So I will pass it over to you, Widger, and uh, Sean both to take it away from here. Thanks. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, hello, and let me say good uh, afternoon from Germany or good morning in Canada. Um, yeah, um, I want to introduce uh, you to the Hydrogen Academy. The Hydrogen Academy was founded from two industrial companies. It was Lifter H2 and Testnet. We are talking here about more about Testnet because Testnet is located in Canada. <clears throat> Both uh, companies um, are um, player in the hydrogen economy. Lifter is responsible for hydrogen infrastructure development, has a team of 20 employees, is located in Berlin, in Germany. Testnet is a global laboratory with two locations. We show them a little bit later. They have um, 50 employees in both uh, places. They are um, providing testing services, especially for high pressure hydrogen and uh, compressed natural gas. Yeah, this is Testnet Group. Um, they are accredited by the DAKKS and IAS and even from the KBI in Germany. Located are they in Vancouver, in Canada, and in Germany, they are located very close to Munich, nearby the airport, and they have an, at both places the test laboratories. Which I'd also like to mention that the two laboratories have a little bit of a different specialization. Yes. Testnet Germany is more specialized in component testing, so valves, yes. components, check valves, smaller items. Uh, and Testnet Canada is more focused on cylinder testing. 
And so for passenger cars, cylinders used to be about 60 liters by water volume. But with all of this new heavy duty stuff, we're starting to see the cylinder sizes change and grow. And we've even seen cylinders as large as 800 liters. So it's a bit, bit of a game changer and a jump in size for this industry. Yeah, thank you. Um, TestNet has these four main pillars of activities that we do. Uh, the, the first pillar is our testing services. This is uh, our, our main meat and potatoes, our bread and butter. Uh, probably over 90% of our activities are performing testing. Uh, so we have uh, uh, extensive laboratories and test benches specifically set up for performing testing with high pressure hydrogen. Uh, also, we have test benches allowing us to perform testing at the temperature extremes. So the, a lot of this leakage testing is performed at minus 40 degrees Celsius and also at plus 85 degrees Celsius. Um, because we have built all of our own facilities, we are sometimes asked for engineering consulting services for helping people with facilities design, uh, coming up with safety uh, concepts and safety procedures, uh, and helping people with inspection, commissioning, and operation of their own testing facilities. For example, a manufacturer uh, asks, has asked us in the past to help design the end-of-line leakage testing where every single valve is hydrogen leak tested before it leaves the factory. Um, TestNet is also a technical service. Uh, so what this means is that, uh, that we, we are a type approval service with the KBA. KBA is the German uh, DOT or tra German Transport Canada. Uh, and so they are approving of all of the aspects of the vehicles which are on the road, specifically hydrogen and alternative fuel vehicles. Uh, and our last uh, pillar of activity is uh, regulations, codes, and standards, R, C, and S. Uh, a, a regulation is a, a law which is did different than a standard. Um, and so we have participated in both the writing and uh, adoption of standards. Uh, we put on workshops and we put on training. And so We've put on so many trainings that it's kind of led to us to creating this new business uh, called the Hydrogen Academy. And so the Hydrogen Academy, uh, we, we felt that we had a unique voice and a unique piece to say about helping to train people in this industry because we have a lot of practical experience. We're not uh, suits and ties. We're like, we took off the lab coat so that we could come, in, come into the office and, and, and teach people about this stuff. Um, so our trainers have specialized knowledge and they also have decades experience. So, so I, I've been around since before the hydrogen industry. I've, I've seen it develop from 35 bar, 5,000 PSI up to the surface pressure of 10,000 PSI or 70 megapascals. So it's, it's kind of uh, grown in, in, over the years and the pressure has increased over the years. Um, if you want to know more about the Hydrogen Academy and our specific training offerings that we have, I'll invite you to please visit the link that's displayed on your screens here. You can go to the Hydrogen Academy. Uh, we have everything from like a, an hour long course intended for executives and high level just to kind of provide people with an introductory background to hydrogen, uh, similar to this webinar. Uh, we also have a day long course in hydrogen safety, uh, which is a, a much more in depth intended for engineers and technicians who are working in this industry. But then we also get into a whole bunch of other different safety uh, and training offerings uh, down to we can teach people how to perform their own hydrogen leakage tests. We can teach people how the certification procedures work for a component or for a cylinder. So we can really kind of help guide people through the uh, through this, this fledging and growing industry. Um, all of you are here today because you're, you're interested in learning more about hydrogen. Uh, okay. I think I wanted to I wanted to start things with a bang. So uh, I wanted to show this a video to kind of capture everybody's attention. Uh, so this is an exam. This is a video showing a cylinder gunfire test or penetration test. Uh, this is one of the standard tests required for all cylinders, containers, vessels, the, the thing that's holding the pressure. Um, and so why do we perform a gunfire test? Well, it's not because we imagine people are going to go around shooting cylinders, but a gunfire test is an easy and simple way to simulate a high energy impact. So particularly for cylinders that are being used in automotive applications or transport app cylinders that move around, um, this is a, a good test. And so this allows you to simulate a high energy impact. 
and it's a at, at the surface level it's a pretty simple test you poke a hole in the cylinder and if all the gas comes out that's a pass if you poke a hole in the cylinder and the cylinder ruptures or fails uh, that's that's a fail um, hydrogen is a very is a not a very dense gas and so the, the gas itself does not prevent the travel of the bullet often you'll have the bullet go through one sidewall and right out the other sidewall uh, in this case it went through just one sidewall so here let me play the video and you guys can see what happens. And so as you can see, this was an example of a pass video. So uh, the bullet penetrated the cylinder. Uh, you can see that uh, there was a little bit of a delamination of the layers uh, at the sidewall of the cylinder. Uh, and I should also explain that the, the bullet entered uh, not at a 90 degree angle, it was coming in at a 45 degree angle because this creates a larger hole in the cylinder. Um, and so not all the tests go like this. Sometimes uh, they don't go as well, but that's the purpose of testing, to, to learn new information about your products and to ensure their safety. Uh, okay, so hydrogen is a, a pretty unique material. Uh, it has some unique safety hazards which are specific to hydrogen uh, and so i'll kind of start on the left hand side work my way to the right so the first one is uh, hydrogen is most commonly used as, as a compressed gas um, there are also liquid hydrogen but I, i'm going to skip liquid hydrogen today i'm just talking about compressed hydrogen um, compressed hydrogen gas is used for vehicles uh, vehicles, trucks, buses, many different applications. It's typically used at one of two different service pressures. And the short cut, short nickname that they use for these service pressures is H35 or H70. Uh, H35 means 35 megapascals, or in the North American units, that's around 5,000 psi service pressure. Uh, and this is not quite enough service pressure to get you the desired range for passenger cars. And so uh, in the mid-2000s, 2008, 2009, the entire industry made the jump up to H70, which is a 70 megapascal surface pressure or 10,000 psi. So let alone the fact that it's a flammable gas, compressing something to 10,000 psi is a lot of energy. So if there's a, a significant safety hazard just because it's a compressed gas. And that's similar to natural gas, but natural gas is done at much lower pressures at around 3,600 PSI as a surface pressure. Um, this compressed gas is an asphyxiant, which means you can't breathe it. Um, you could go on YouTube and find videos of people trying to breathe in helium. Well, I, I recommend against that. It's not that safe. Um, so if you have a large volume leak of hydrogen, it can potentially cause breathing problems. You, you can't breathe it. You need to leave the area. Um, hydrogen gas is also a very buoyant gas. It is uh, 14 times lighter than air. Uh, if you were to have a race between a helium balloon and a hydrogen balloon, the uh, hydrogen balloon would go up twice as fast as the helium balloon. Uh, the buoyancy of hydrogen gas is why it was actually used in zeppelins and blimps. Uh, Everybody knows the story of the Hindenburg Zeppelin, uh, which is a, kind of a cautionary tale for hydrogen use. Uh, it's a complicated story because the blimp actually failed and burnt because of the skin, not because it was filled with hydrogen. But once the skin got burning, the fact that it was filled with hydrogen contributed quite a lot to the flames. Um, yeah, I, I could do a whole presentation just on, on Zeppelins. Um, hydrogen is also unique because it is a colorless and odorless gas. Uh, natural gas, everybody is familiar with that rotten egg smell for natural gas. Uh, and in fact, your nose is much better at sensing uh, that mercaptan smell than uh, a sensor is. Um, but with hydrogen, this is not possible. Typical uses for hydrogen is in a fuel cell, and fuel cells. Uh, require very pure, very high quality hydrogen. So it's not possible to add an odorant to hydrogen. Therefore, you cannot rely on your nose to detect it. You're going to have to rely on a sensor or a detector or a machine. More on that later. I have some slides to show on that. Um, so those are the kind of 
high level, uh, the, f the first layer of hazards to discuss. Uh, the next layer of hazards to discuss regarding hydrogen is that it's a flammable gas. So it's a flammable gas, just like natural gas, propane, or many other gases that you are familiar with in your daily life. What's unique about hydrogen is it has a, an incredibly wide flammability range. If you've ever had the pleasure of tuning a carburetor, what you're doing is you're, you're tuning the amount of air to fuel ratio to get that perfect flammability range. And gasoline has a very narrow flammability range. Well, that's very different for hydrogen. Hydrogen has a very wide flammability range from 4% to 75% in air. Basically, if hydrogen is mixed with air, it will burn. And so one of the main safety uh, steps to try and prevent uh, hydrogen incidents is don't let hydrogen and air mix. Don't allow leaks. Don't allow uh, mixing of uh, oxygen and hydrogen. Kind of trying to take away one leg of the fire triangle can eliminate fires. In addition to having this wide flammability range, hydrogen also has a very low ignition energy. What this means is the amount of spark or the amount of energy necessary to ignite a mixture of hydrogen and air. And so uh, this low ignition energy is almost 100 times lower than gasoline. So if you can imagine the, uh, a spark plug and the, the spark that a spark plug generates, if you've ever had weak spark and you've had a, an engine not running properly, well, hydrogen requires 100 times lower energy to ignite, to ignite than a gasoline mixture. And so this low ignition energy means that if you have a mixture of air and hydrogen, if it's there, it will burn. And so that's another unique hazard to, to hydrogen. The last one I want to talk about uh, specific safety hazards is the fact that hydrogen is the smallest molecule. Uh, if you're familiar with the periodic table of elements, it's up there in the, the top left-hand corner. It's the very first element. Um, it has, because of its low si uh, molecular size and very small size, it has a big propensity to leak. Uh, the, the kind of size factor analogy that I often use to explain this is uh, if you were to imagine a nitrogen molecule being about the size of a beach ball, we're all breathing in 79% nitrogen right now, um, if you were to imagine nitrogen molecules being about the size of a beach ball, a hydrogen molecule would be about the size of a pea. So they are very small little molecules. Um, hydrogen likes to form uh, covalent bonds with its buddies. So a hydrogen atom seldomly will exist all by himself. And so what they'll do is they'll form, here's my little laser pointer here. Uh, they'll form a covalent bond, and two hydrogen atoms will gang together, and they'll share their electrons together. This is why hydrogen is often abbreviated as H2. And uh, a trick that sometimes is, is used in the industry, in instead of performing testing with hydrogen gas, uh, often helium gas is used in its place, and one helium atom is almost the same size as two hydrogen atoms uh, glommed together in a molecule. And so the, the idea of using helium is that it is not a flammable gas, but it is still very small, uh, allowing you to test for that kind of leaks. Because of this very small molecule size, hydrogen can often cause hydrogen embrittlement. So this is a special term, a special, special thing that happens with hydrogen. I've got a whole slide about that one. Okay, so hydrogen embrittlement. Uh, this is a very deep topic. I'm kind of like introducing to you to guys to the Pacific Ocean. It's deep and it's wet. Uh, there are a, there's a lot of information about this. Um, I'm just kind of introducing the topic to you. So what is hydrogen embrittlement? So hydrogen embrittlement is where you have the degradation of the mechanical strength or mechanical properties of a, of a particular material as a result of exposure exposure to hydrogen. Um, so ima imagine a, a tensile test where you're pulling on a piece of metal and you think that the piece of metal is gonna break at a certain strength. Well, now you do the same test, but in your environment of hydrogen and the piece of metal is gonna break at a 10 times lower number, 10 times lower value because of this exposure to hydrogen. And so that's a, a big deal breaker when you're trying to build things that don't leak. Um, and so there's two main types of exposure. Uh, so the gaseous hydrogen exposure at high pressure 
the high pressure can cause hydrogen to seep and creep into any little cracks or openings or occlusions, dislocations. And so the second type is cathodic hydrogen. So this is where hydrogen will actually creep into the material and then form secondary reactions and uh, corrosion reactions. And can it can degrade a material along grain boundaries and prevent, prevent it from being strong. Um, this hydrogen embrittlement is affected by the environment. So the amount of time exposure is important. The amount of pressure exposure is important. The amount of stress exposure is important. So if you can reduce these things, reduce the time, reduce the pressure, reduce the uh, stress, you can reduce the effect of hydrogen embrittlement. There are some materials which are uh, badly affected, uh, in particular, high strength steels and high toughness alloys. The, the typical go-to materials that are, are um, good for building strong things, such as titanium, high strength steels, aircraft aluminum alloys, these materials perform very poorly in hydrogen service. How did they find this out? Well, this was found out the hard way when people tried to make high strength cylinders out of high strength, make high pressure cylinders out of high strength steel. Um, there are some materials which are known good materials. And so these are the uh, uh, stainless steel, uh, 316, 304 stainless steel, and some aluminum elements. Um, I am a metals and materials engineering by, by training, so I, I can geek out on this subject a lot. But I just wanted to introduce you guys to this concept. Um, if you want to learn more, I, I have a link here on the screen for uh, Sandia National Labs, uh, and they have uh, materials reference sheets where they offer a lot more information about good materials and bad materials. Um, there are also uh, many different types of tests, uh, testing standards for testing materials for hydrogen exposure, both testing metallic materials and also testing non-metallic materials such as O-rings, seals, diaphragms, and stuff like that. So there, it's a, a known thing in the industry and there are tests specifically for this kind of thing. So if you need to know more information, please feel free to reach out to me directly or you can go and explore this, this link uh, shown here. Okay, I talked a little bit about this before. So because of hydrogen's uh, unique qualities, it's colorless, odorless gas, you need to rely on a sensor to be able to detect hydrogen. Um, the good thing about hydrogen is that its buoyancy means that the sensor placement is very easy. Sensors are typically placed at the roof level or the highest point in a, uh, a hydrogen operating area. Um, I have a photograph, an example of one tip sensor that we are using here in our laboratory. This is a Honeywell uh, branded sensor. And so it consists of two parts. It consists of a transmitter display, which is typically mounted at eye level. Uh, and the second part is the actual hydrogen sensor head, which is typically mounted at ceiling level. Uh, and so uh, in our laboratory, we have our um, sensors programmed and linked to our fire panel systems. So this is part of our life safety systems. Uh, and the, the way these sensors work is uh, the, the lower flammability limit or the lower explosive limit of hydrogen is 4% concentration in air. And so we begin to sound the hydrogen alarm at 10% of this lower explosive limit. So 10% of that 4% in air is a very low concentration of hydrogen. But we're, we're already beginning to put on the, the warning sirens, the warning alarms at this low concentration. If the concentration continues to increase in, in the laboratory or the test area at 25% of the lower explosive limit, so 25% of that 4% lower explosive limit, then we are going to cut off all of the electricity into the affected area. So cutting off the electricity by opening an electrical contactor, this, the, the fire panel is controlling an electrical contactor or an electrical switch. Um, this removes all potential ignition sources and removes all uh, electricity from the area to uh, help minimize uh, any potential ignition. Um, at the 10% level, we are also triggering a fan. So we have a, a ventilation system which will uh, increase the number of air exchanges in the laboratory to ventilate this hydrogen and get it out of that space and bring it uh, to the outside area. So a little bit of special infrastructure required to set up your facility to deal with hydrogen. Uh, special sensors are required. 
special ventilation systems are required. And these are not very common uh, and requires uh, smart electricians, smart HVAC people. You, you need to you need a little bit of experience to to make these systems work correctly. We also have different kinds of sensors that we use in our everyday uh, working life in the laboratory and while operating our hydrogen compressors and our storage systems. Uh, we have two um, test benches here, which is a hydrogen gas cycle test bench. And so we fill up a test cylinder and then drain the test cylinder. And so this simulates the same kind of experience you would have with filling a car and then driving a car around for 600, 500, 600 kilometers and draining it. Uh, and so our test benches, we basically have all of the similar equipment that you would have at a hydrogen refueling station. But instead of refueling cars in a public setting, we are refueling um, parts of cars or cylinders or fuel systems. And so uh, it's kind of common to have a little bit of a leakage when you're disconnecting or connecting, making that an initial connection. And so we rely on two different types of uh, hydrogen sensors. These are the handheld sensors. Um, first, we'll talk about the more simple, cheap one. So this is the Baccarat. Uh, if you've ever worked in the natural gas industry, you're probably familiar with these. Uh, they kind of work like a Geiger counter where they provide an audible signal and they go tick, 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 tick. And the frequency of ticking increases to indicate that it has detected a flammable gas. These uh, Baccarat handheld sensors work for all flammable gases because of the nature of the sensor. Um, so they will work for natural gas, they will work for propane, they will detect gasoline fumes, uh, and they also very, work very well for hydrogen. Uh, it's got a little thumb wheel so you can increase the gain setting so you can make them as sensitive or not sensitive as you want to. Uh, and they work on a simple battery operation and they're uh, uh, operating at a low enough voltage that they are intrinsically safe and can be used inside the uh, hazardous zones. The, they, they're, the baccarat sensor is very simple. It's basically a yes, no sensor. Is there hydrogen present? Yes or no. It won't tell you the quantity. You can use the tip to pinpoint the leak location. So, you, can, you know, is it this fitting? No, is it that fitting? Yes. So you can kind of like uh, move the tip around to help locate the leak. That same is true with our other type of sensor that we use. Uh, this type of sensor is a very different. It, it has a little pump and it's continuously drawing in a sample of, uh, of air gas from the tip and it expels it out the bottom. Um, this type of sensor also has a parts per million PPM readout. So not only can it tell you, hey, it's leaking, yes, no, but it also can give you an indication of the severity, quantity of the leak. Um, they're a little bit more expensive, uh, they're a little bit more difficult to find, and they're a little bit more fussy to operate and calibrate. Uh, but we use both of these types of sensors in our laboratory, in addition to the uh, kind of facility level sensors, which I, I talked about on that first slide. Um, in our facility, we actually have a total of eight hydrogen sensors. Uh, many of the sensors are located inside our test chambers. So it's like a, think of like a big refrigerator or a big freezer, and then that's where we're performing the test inside the freezer. And then the test chamber has a sensor inside, and then there's also a sensor in the area outside of the chamber. So if the leakage is large enough to overcome the uh, test chamber and leak outside of the test chamber, then we're going to be first shutting down the test chamber, next layer shutting down the entire laboratory that the test chamber is housed within. Um, there also exist uh, these kind of personal H2 monitors. I've got a, a, again, I'm showing the Honeywell brand and a couple of other different brands. These are like uh, about the size of an iPhone. They're designed to be clipped onto your pocket. Um, and they provide an audible alarm, letting the wearer know that they detect hydrogen. These are, uh, th they work great, but they have one flaw and drawback is that they measure the hydrogen concentration in your pocket. And often that's not where you're interested in learning the hydrogen concentration. So these are useful in theory, but in practice, they're, they're not as useful as having the wand where you can point it at, at your fittings or point it at your processor. Um, and then what often happens is they get forgotten in a pocket and the batteries run out. Anyways, um, 
The next topic I wanted to introduce is the concept of fire retardant clothing. Uh, this is already kind of very common in the oil and gas industry. Uh, there's kind of two main ways to make uh, fire retardant clothing. One is by applying a, a coating or a, a chemical. Uh, so applying a coating or a chemical to like a cotton garment. Uh, this is not, a, so it works great when they're brand new, but uh, if you've ever worn coveys or lab coat before, because you're wearing them because you're going to get dirty, so eventually you're going to wash them. And as you wash the garment, you remove that fire retardant uh, coating. Um, so the, the better type of uh, product is to get uh, actual fabric. That's a fire, fire retardant fabric. Uh, one of the big brand names for this industry is uh, Nomex fabric is very common. And I think that's this blue uh, fabric here. They make a, a heavier version for winter. They make a, a lighter version for summer. Uh, Nomex fabric is also used a lot in uh, race suits, race gloves, race equipment. Um, and so there's different categories for FR clothing. Um, it's our recommendation that FR clothing is worn by the technicians, engineers, and people who are actually going to be doing the physical hands-on touching and working in the area with hydrogen pipes, working where in the areas where hydrogen is going to be. Um, so it offers a, a little bit of a level of protection uh, in the in the unwanted when when you're potentially exposed to a hydrogen flame or hydrogen gas itself. Um, Next, I wanted to talk about uh, some of the relevant hydrogen codes and standards. Um, I'm going to talk about the American version first, which is the NFPA2. So NFPA2 is not really as applicable in Canada, but uh, NFPA2 document has a lot of great additional background information. Um, it talks specifically about the general fire safety requirements. It has specific uh, sections, including how to set up and, and create a repair garage for hydrogen uh, vehicles. Uh, it offers safety tips for, you know, in its annexes, kind of guiding and coaching people into uh, how to uh, how, how to use hydrogen in a safe fashion. Um, and it has a little bit uh, more meat to it than the Canadian version. So the Canadian version is the Canadian Hydrogen Installation Code, or the CHIC for short. Um, it actually has you know, one of those kind of boring standards names. It's called the uh, uh, Bureau, it's the French, the Quebecois Bureau National, Bureau National du Québec, uh, and it's standard 1784. Uh, it was just recently updated in 2022, so it's uh, a fresh standard. It's been recently looked at. Um, and it, it is very similar to and harmonious with NFPA2. So the two standards don't contradict each other. Uh, they, they kind of are talking about the same subjects and have many of the same numbers and many of the same uh, quantities and amounts. Um, I'm just recommending that if you are interested in building some hydrogen infrastructure that you go and read both. I recommend that the CHIC is applicable to the Alberta and British Columbia and Canada market, but uh, NFPA2 offers additional information that's also very useful. Um, the CHIC establishes the installation requirements for basically all permanent infrastructure, um, for generating hydrogen, for utilizing hydrogen, for dispensing hydrogen, for the storage containers, ground storage, where you're going to be holding hydrogen. Um, it does not apply to um, onboard vehicle systems. So those are different standards for onboard the vehicle. Um, this does not apply to oil and gas pipeline distribution systems and transmission. So there's there's kind of it's very clear about what its scope is, which is nice. So this is in, that's out. It's it's very clear. Um, and then here in the photograph, I actually have this is an example of one of our uh, hydrogen compressors. Um, as you can see here, it's a diaphragm style compressor. So a bunch of different uh, diaphragms um, where hydrogen is on one side and oil is on the other side, and the diaphragm is uh, bent just like a Snapple lid to, uh, to, to compress the hydrogen. This diaphragm style compressor separates the hydrogen from the oil so you can avoid oil contamination of the compressor. People in the know will recognize the blue color and know that this is a PDC hydrogen compressor. Um, there's also a unique thing for the Canadian market and this is called the CRN number, Canadian registration number. number. CRN. 
Um, CRN applies to pressure vessels, boilers, autoclaves, fittings. Uh, in the photograph here, I'm showing an example of our hydrogen low bank system. Uh, and so this is a cylinder that we use at around, it, it's a pretty large cylinder, almost 3,000 gallons in, in size. Uh, and we use this around 50 to 100 PSI for our low bank. Uh, and this was a special vessel that we had to get made with a CRN number. Um, so each province has its own authority having jurisdiction. Uh, in British Columbia, it's Technical Safety BC. In Quebec, it's RBQ. Uh, in Alberta, I, I believe there's different uh, technical uh, sa technical safety jurisdiction as well. Uh, and so basically, if you're going to build infrastructure for hydrogen stuff, you need to ensure that the components, fittings, valves, vessels, and things uh, have a CRN number. So you need to speak with your people that you're buying your parts and, and things from. They would be able to share more information. Um, I feel that I've spoken very quickly through my slides. Uh, that that kind of concludes my presentation for today. Uh, again, this is intended to be a, a quickie and a high level. We're just kind of like introducing you guys to many of these concepts. Hopefully, we've piqued your interest for more. Hopefully, you want to learn more. And so, please, I put my contact information here at the bottom. Don't hesitate to reach out to me or don't hesitate to ask a question, question and answers period, uh, which we're going to be doing now. So I'll, I'll sign off there. Thank you very much, everybody, for listening. Yeah, thanks for that, Sean. Great, uh, great presentation. Lots of really good information there. Um, there are a couple of questions. There was, I saw some questions in the chat, but we'll, we'll move to the Q&A. Um, so this one from Monica, uh, does you, you had a chart about, you know, good metals and bad metals for hydrogen. Um, does in the good metal category, is there a zero effect altogether from hydrogen or do they also degrade just in a longer period? As I get older, I realize that nothing lasts forever. So that's my answer. Nothing lasts forever. Um, but the 316, 316 stainless steel performs very well. I've had a uh, our plumbing and piping systems were built here at our laboratories in 2015. I've had one of those stainless steel 316 lines pressurized and energized since 2015. Mm -hmm. So uh, many, many years of service is no problems. But is it going to last a thousand years? No, who knows, right? Yeah. yeah, I guess do you maybe more pointed, do you know of any like, have you inspected any of those lines or have you observed or know of any studies that have attempted to observe any degradation over longer periods? Yes. Hydrogen and brillamine is a very large topic of study, particularly for the materials that are being used most in the industry. So you will find a lot of information regarding hydrogen and brillamine for uh, 316 stainless steel uh, and many other forms of stainless steel as these are the the go-to materials for the hydrogen industry. So those materials you can find a lot of information about. But if you're coming up with your own new material or trying to use a material that is not as commonly used, there is not as much information uh, on other materials. So there's definitely, uh, there's a, a whole room for improvement or room for study uh, on the hydrogen brittlement and different materials. It's a deep subject. I just kind of wanted to show you the tip of the iceberg. That's great. Um, so we have a couple of sort of related questions. I'll ask the first one. Um, it, it's regarding the hydrogen sensors in a building. Um, and, and maybe I can add on my own question is, um, so the, the question is around uh, the placement of sensors. And is there any guidance on like, wouldn't it depend on the, the diffusion and the source of of hydrogen, how far away you put this, the sensors? How is this addressed? And I guess my question is, is there any guidance in those standards like the NFPA2 around how to design kind of a facility, you know, if you have a certain volume of hydrogen, pressure of hydrogen, where, you know, size of room, where and how many sensors should there be? Yeah, so the, all of those contributing factors do affect where will the hydrogen go, how will it diffuse, how will it, what if I'm just, what if I knock the head off of the bottle, where's it going to go? What if it's just a teeny tiny leak and one bubble every minute? Where's it going to go? The answer is it's going to go up. It's 14 times lighter than air. It's going to end up on the ceiling no matter what, it, no matter how it's released. Um, some of the difficulties can be uh, the volume or the size of the room. 
So if you have a cylinder being released in a small closet, that's a different situation than if you have a cylinder being released in a 4,000 square foot shop. Uh, and so we have a hydrogen sensor in our main shop space, but we've never triggered it because of the, 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 the volume of the space relative to the sensor. Um, whereas in some of our um, environmental chambers, our component environmental chamber is one meter by one meter by one meter. And if you have any small leakage, the sensor will very quickly tell you so. And so, yes, the, the volume and size of the space does matter, but because of the buoyancy of the gas, the answer is always up. It's going to go up. And so NFPA2 and the CHIC do have some guidance and information. I believe on one of my slides, um, it actually, Annex K in the NFPA2 actually has a whole, a whole annex, a whole subsection just about hydrogen detection systems and recommendations for placements. Good question. Yeah, thanks. And and then I guess sort of a related comment. Um, can you comment on the dispersion characteristics of hydrogen? You know, sort of in that same context, like does it my understanding is that if you have a bit of a leak, it's gonna kind of go up in a straight stream fairly quickly, as opposed to dispersing throughout the whole space, I guess. So hydrogen also has a very high diffusion rate. Diffusion of chemistry twelve. Remember it's that's the the propensity of a gas to expand into the space. So if you imagine hydrogen atom shows up at the party and he opens the door, boom, hydrogen atoms everywhere. So that dispersal means that you're quickly going to have hydrogen in every corner of the room, everywhere, uh, but there will be different concentration levels. So at the source, it will be the highest concentration, possibly 100% hydrogen. Uh, and, and the far corners, it's going to be lower concentrations of hydrogen. But the, the unfortunate thing is that the, this, almost no matter what the hydrogen concentration is, if it's 4% or 75%, if it's there, it's still a flammable mixture. I, I think, did I, did I answer your question correctly? I think I... I think yeah, I, I think so. I, I love that analogy. If hydrogen walks into the party and opens the door. He's everywhere at once. <laughs> He's <Yeah>. everywhere. <laughs> We've all got friends like that, I'm sure. <laughs> um, so I'm going to zoom out a little bit with this question, thinking about kind of across the whole hydrogen value chain, you know, production, transportation, storage, and end use. Is there any differences in, you know, the sensors you might use or the leak detection strategy or anything like that? And then maybe a follow-on question to that is what are, what are some leak mitigation techniques? Okay, so two-part question. Let's tackle the first part first. So yes, different types of sensors are used in different realms of the hydrogen industry. Um, the automotive sensors are quite a little bit different than the sensors that we're using here in the laboratory and, and the sensors that I was showing you in the slides. Um, the automotive sensors are yeah, electronically different, um, They but they employ a similar type of uh, catalytic bead sensor. There are quite a few different technologies for sensing hydrogen. Um, there are also problems with poisoning of hydrogen sensors. So if you're in a shop where guys are using spray paint cans, the volatile organic compounds from spray paint can sometimes uh, block or blind a hydrogen sensor. So you need to be cautious with what type of sensor and in what environment it's being used. Um, Okay, and then Mark, what was the second part of the question is? Uh, mi leak mitigation techniques. Leak mitigation techniques. The best way to prevent leaks is to go look for them. So going, the best way to, to look for leaks is the very first time you build anything. So any the very first time you build a plumbing system, you build a cylinder system, you, anytime you're putting together equipment or a machine, Perform a detailed leak test is required. Often the initial leak test is performed with a nitrogen gas, so beach balls instead of peas, and that allows you to find any gross leakages or like, oh, hey, somebody forgot to do up this fitting. It's, it, that needs to be corrected. Um, and then only after this initial inerting with nitrogen and initial, initial pressure checking with nitrogen, do you then go on to testing with hydrogen. Um, it is not impossible to create a completely hydrogen leak-free system. 
but it requires diligence and maintenance. Um, at our laboratory, we turned it into a game. So anytime somebody made up a fitting, you had to write your initial and your name on the fitting. You had to like be personally accountable for that fitting. And so I made up a hundred fittings and my technician made up, you know, more fittings and my other technician made up fittings. And at the end of the day, we pressurized the system and okay, whose fitting is leaking? And so human beings are by their very nature competitive. So we use that competitive nature to make our system safe. Um, and so anytime a change is made to the system, oh, I got to disconnect a pipe. Oh, I got to do some maintenance. Anytime a change occurs, that rechecking leak procedure needs to happen again. And so, yeah, with, with hydrogen system maintenance, you have to be more prescribed and more formal about it. Uh, there needs to be better communication between the multiple parties involved. Uh, at our laboratory, we cover this with uh, job safety analysis, and we cover this with written procedures for almost everything that we do. And so you have to write, write what you're going to do, and then do it, and then prove that you do it, document it. So there's a, yeah, a few extra layers uh, required for hydrogen safety than is common in your average workshop. Well, I'm going to jump around in the the questions here, just because there's a bit of a follow on question. What like what have you seen as the most common cause of leaks? Like it it sounds like probably in the assembly process, but further in the life of the equipment, is there like a common mode of failure? Like is it seals or rot, corrosion or have you do you have any sense of what that is? The most common form of failure that I have seen is minus forty degrees Celsius. 10,000 PSI. So O-rings in particular at minus 40 degrees Celsius and 10,000 PSI. So it's the combination of low temperature and high pressure that causes O-ring seals to fail. And so for this reason, we try and avoid using O-ring seals. Uh, many of the fitting types that we use, uh, such as cone and thread fittings or swage lock fittings, are relying on a metal to metal seal. Um, you, you can't completely get away from O-rings. You need to have them in many, many applications, particularly in cylinder and end fitting connections. Uh, but a lot of manufacturers have now changed their O-ring sealing strategies. And so they've gone with uh, double O-rings. So if it get past the first one, there's a second one. So it's like having two goalies. Uh, and a lot of the O-rings are also... Uh, special materials special flavors of, of rubbers and vitons and uh, and then they'll also use backup rings because that that 10,000 psi is a lot of uh, compressed energy a lot of force and so they'll rely on o-ring with the backup ring a secondary o-ring with the backup ring and so yeah o-rings are the kind of the biggest point of failure that i've seen in our in the automotive hydrogen industry and world the next point is uh, any of the soft goods that you have in a valve. So valves are typically opened and closed and opened and closed, and they go through millions and millions of open and closing cycles, both for ball valves and for needle valves, where the needle is, is open and closed. Um, we've had such a problem with ball valves in our laboratory that we've started to replace ball valves with needle valves. So then we're also using a specific kind of needle valve where it's a metal on metal seat. So that means that the seat is a metal thing and the needle is a metal thing. And so you, you're relying on this metal on metal seal, but you're not relying on an O-ring to, to form the seal. Um, so those are the yeah leaking valves over after many cycles and uh, leaking O-rings. Those are the places that uh, we have the worst problems. And to combat these problems, don't use O-rings, use metal on metal and uh, try and uh, ha enforce or have a maintenance cycle. So rather than, oh, we're just gonna operate this valve until it breaks, no, no, we're gonna, we know the valve is gonna break at around oh, 40,000 cycles or wh whatever the manufacturer recommends. And okay, we're gonna replace this valve before it breaks. So preventative maintenance scheduling to, to avoid hydrogen leakage. Yeah, I imagine even those metal to metal needle valve seats, you still have issues around the valve stem. Mm -hmm. Do you would you prefer, is a, like, leak. orient the, the valve stem to be on the low pressure side of the hydrogen or on the less exposed? Do you, do you get to that level of detail or not? Oh, yeah. Yeah. So 
they're normal in a needle valve configuration. You can have a flow through configuration or you can have an angled configuration. And the angled configuration gives you higher flow rates. The angled configuration also allows for easier replacement of the seat because in the flow through configuration, you have to replace the entire valve body. Um, I, I, have, I have a whole bunch of great slides it, about this subject in one of our hydrogen safety training seminars. Um, yeah, for ball valves, there's also, I, I recently was attending the Hydrogen and FC Expo in Tokyo, Japan, and there's uh, some Japanese manufacturers that are doing some very clever things to try and solve this problem for ball valves. Um, they're using a diamond-like coating on the ball itself to give greater strength to, uh, strength and surface uh, surface properties and cleanliness to the uh, to the ball itself. And then they're using a different seat on the upstream side and a different type of material on the downstream side. So they're not the upstream and downstream side are, are different, which is kind of a unique idea. So yeah, there's a there's this has been a big Valves have been a big problem in the hydrogen industry for a number of years, and valves have slowly gotten better over a number of years. Yeah, it's very, once you dive into the details, it's very, it gets very complex quickly. Um, we do have a bunch more questions. I don't think we're going to get to all of them. Um, you know, I don't want to run us right to the end of the hour, too. So maybe uh, we'll do one or two more. There's one on, and I'm not sure if you'll have the answer to this, but on repurposing natural gas piping on the distribution network for gas piping that goes to your home. Ooh, that's an hour long topic all by itself. <laughs> um, maybe just, maybe we could sort of parse it out and let's just talk about, I think what's most common at, at least in the Edmonton region is that piping is low pressure um, polymer like, like an HDPE or something like that. Um, what are your thoughts or do you have any thoughts, I guess, or comments on that, given that it's a low pressure and you mentioned that high pressure is one of the bad things for embrittlement and, and B, it's non-metallic. Let me um, answer your question with a question. Do you know how much hydrogen is in your natural gas right now? Uh, what is it? It varies from like 2% to 10%, something like that, 15% maybe. So you, you already have hydrogen in your house. Yeah. Um, actually, one of the very first uses of hydrogen gas was... Uh, is called town gas, and it was used for lighting lamps in uh, like Victorian era London, uh, and so this this town gas was a mixture of natural gas and hydrogen, and it came from a naturally occurring source. So, my short and succinct answer about hydrogen in natural gas is up to ten percent is probably fine. Um, to do more than that, the, the idea here is that they want to be able to like, hey, we'll put the natural gas, we'll put the hydrogen in the pipeline here let it go from point A to point B, and we'll take the hydrogen back out here to take advantage of existing pipelines and existing infrastructure. We don't have to build new infrastructure to move hydrogen around. And this is a good idea on the surface, but there's a lot of details that need to be gone, gone through. This is a subject that is being studied extensively. I don't have, I don't, I'm not super knowledgeable about this subject, but I, I know that it is definitely a topic of interest for many utility scale gas companies and pipeline owners and operators. So my short answer, up to 10% is okay. Okay, well maybe, uh, well actually, you know, there's a real quick question here probably. Could you provide your comments on extended hydro tests versus helium tests for the valves in the oil and gas industry? Specifically API 6D. I'm not sure if you're familiar with API 6D. Yes, I am. I participated in some of the initial standards and stuff like that. This sounds... I think I actually know who's asking the question. So um, hydrostatic is a strength test. It tests, hydrostatic is where you test a valve with water and it tells you how strong the valve is. It doesn't tell you if it leaks or not. So to test if it's leaking or not, you need to use hydrogen gas. That's the best way. Um, helium gas is a close second. It, helium gas allows you to get away from some of the flammable gas issues or hazards. Not every uh, laboratory or space is set up to use flammable gas in it. Another way to get around this problem is using forming gas. So forming gas is typically 95% nitrogen and 5% hydrogen. And so this allows you to perform a leakage test with kind of hydrogen, uh, but at a lower concentration and a lower hazard level. Um, and so, yeah, 
you're you're asking about hydrostatic versus helium you're asking about apples versus oranges they're different things different tests if you want to know if something is hydrogen leakage free you have to test it with hydrogen sounds great and i think we'll probably end there thanks so much for your time today obviously we could probably keep talking about this for many 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 more hours but um to all the attendees, feel free to reach out. Um, Sean's email is, is there on the slides. So thanks everybody and we'll bid you a good day. Thanks everybody for participating. Thanks for listening. Give me a call if you need some more help.